Hello, everyone, and welcome to Roger Williams University's event today on integrating doctrine and diversity. We're so pleased that you could join us. My name is Gregory Bowman, and I have the deep honor and privilege of serving as the dean of this fine law school at Roger Williams University. And I want to start us today by reading our land and labor acknowledgement. So I want to take a moment as we start to reflect on the lands on which we reside. We are coming from many places today and we want to acknowledge the ancestral homelands and traditional territories of indigenous and native peoples who have been here since time immemorial. And to recognize that we must continue to build our solidarity and kinship with native peoples across the Americas and across the globe. Roger Williams University School of Law is located in Bristol, Rhode Island. And so we acknowledge and we honor the Narragansett and Poconoke people, as well as Soams, the original name of the land on which our campus resides. We also acknowledge that this country would not exist if it were not for the free and slave labor of black people. And we recognize that the town of Bristol, and the very land on which the campus and the trade of enslaved people from Africa. The economy of New England, of Rhode Island, and more specifically of Bristol, was built from wealth generated through the tribal trade of human lives. During this time of ongoing national reckoning with our history of slavery and the disparate treatment of black people, we honor the legacy of the, aspir the African diaspora and the black lives, knowledge, and skills stolen due to violence and white supremacy. As we gather here today online, the movement for justice and liberation is building in our country and we are witnessing the power of the people. Yet many are still being met with violence and even being killed, while others actively work to stand in the way of progress. As upholders of justice, our hope is to become agents of change for members of our society who have been met with violence, physical, mental, emotional, through our privilege. And as upholders of justice, we believe that our students, who soon will be practitioners of law, can be and already are agents of change as well. Thank you again for joining us and I hope you enjoyed today's program and find it instructional and informative. Thanks, Greg. Um, what you don't see uh, is the craziness of tech issues behind the scenes. So welcome everybody. Uh, I just want to take a big, deep breath uh, and send some calming thoughts to our speakers uh, who are probably as stressed out as I am about things not going exactly perfect. Um, but uh, good afternoon or morning, depending on where you are. Welcome to the third of our the third event of our third year of integrating doctrine and diversity speaker series. I'm Nicole, moderator of today's session titled Beyond the Casebook, DEIB, and Supplementary Materials. Um, thank you to our sponsors, RW Law, CUNY Law, Jurist, Berkeley Law, and GW Law. To start, I want to quote two of our speakers today, Anamika and Danielle. This quote really inspired me to put this event together, and I wanted to share it to help set our intention. Quote, it is not enough to be non-racist, Faculty must make their co courses and curriculum an actively anti-racist. This requires a decolonizing pedagogy that lifts those who have been oppressed. Many have already begun this work. However, it is high time for us to reach a critical mass. Students of all backgrounds benefit from ethical and inclusive teaching. Collectively, we must provide students with an honest representation of knowledge to heal and push towards a just society. Students deserve the opportunity to think critically about the world around them. And as faculty, our job is to give them the tools they need to make the world a better place, end quote. This topic was further developed after conversations with several law professors at different institutions who all presented me with a, a pretty similar dilemma. Uh, professors have said to me, generally speaking, they like their case books enough. They feel like their casebooks do a good job and they're used to using a casebook. They like how they're organized-ish. They like the topics they cover for the most part. They 
greatly respect their casebook editors, but they don't feel like there is enough breadth of coverage on diversity, equity, equality, and social justice issues. As such, professors, these professors who I spoke with, are open to creating or using content from beyond the casebook, but are looking for advice on how to develop this, develop this content, how to select the content, and how to use the content uh, as assignments or in class. Today, we have two law professor panelists that have worked to creatively supplement their casebooks. We also have two criminology professors who will present an anti-racist and decolonized teaching and learning framework to employ when considering adding materials beyond your casebook. To begin, please meet Deb and Tung. Deb is the Vice Dean for Intellectual Life and Professor of Law at Seattle University School of Law. Um, Tung is a Professor of Law at Lewis and Clark Law School. Just as sort of an introductory matter, do you find this to be a relatable problem? Can you share your thoughts on the subject matter of casebooks generally? What are your perspective about how well casebook editors integrate DEIB skills and content? Do you have, do you want to give a shout out to a casebook you particularly like? And I guess, have you seen things change over time? Um, Deb, if you want to go first and then Tom. Yeah, so I have been teaching, I think at this point, I don't want to do the math. Um, I'm a lawyer, right? But I think about 17 years. And what I would say is everything that Nicole said was very relatable to me, which is I teach at law school and always have taught at law schools where it's important to make sure that the students get the content that they need in order to pass the bar. I only teach bar tested classes. And so as a general matter, I found casebooks to be pretty helpful in delivering that information to students in a way that is easy for them to digest and that the organization makes sense. And over the time that I've been teaching, even out of some of the same textbooks as they have updated editions, I've noticed that casebook authors have gotten much better about integrating DEI materials into the casebooks and have been really appreciative of the fact that they've done so. My perspective, and this is something that I think we'll get back to, is that I think they've done a really great job of doing that. The problem often is that what we're teaching are cases and uh, rules that themselves are not particularly great in terms of their DEI coverage. And that's not the casebook author's fault. Um, that's just where we're kind of sending the focus of the students. And so even if you include a lot of really wonderful excerpts from law review articles and other DEI materials that I think that uh, casebook authors have gotten much better about including, the students still kind of gravitate towards the cases, and that's kind of a reality of using casebooks. And so that's something that I've observed. Casebooks have gotten much better, but it still takes a lot of effort to make sure that you're getting the coverage of DEI issues that you would like. Um, Deb, before Tang jumps in, could you tell us what classes you typically teach with, with, what, with casebooks? I, I teach the, the three classes I pretty much teach every single year are our first year criminal law class, you know, the introductory criminal law class, criminal procedure investigative. So the fourth, fifth and sixth amendment materials and evidence. So those are the three classes I pretty much always teach. I occasionally teach some other courses, but that's that's really my portfolio. Thank you. Sorry, Tong. Um, no worries. Um, so I actually teach more or less the same classes that Deb does. Uh, I do not teach substantive criminal law. We require Crim Pro uh, as our first year course. And I also teach the bail to jail class, which is Crim Pro too. Um, so case books, uh, I remember a former colleague of mine actually wrote a short law review article reviewing criminal procedure case books back in the early 2000s and noted that back then there was already a shift from the older style of just simply here are the cases to um, some newer books that were integrating a lot more. They didn't think of it as DEI at the time, but much more real world information, particularly about race, class, um, social issues. Um, and so I, I've stuck with one of those books, which is Alan Hoffman, uh, Comprehensive Criminal Procedures. It's a gigantic book. Um, but I've had students say that they actually have kept it on their shelves and have referred to it, the ones who've gone into criminal practice. And what I think it does well, at least as far as case books can do, is there are the, the uh, citations of law review articles, but there are actual discussions sometimes of statistics or 
some acknowledgement of race or acknowledgement that the Supreme Court has not discussed race, even though it might seem relevant in particular opinions. Um, it's striking that in talking about Terry versus Ohio, the um, stop and frisk case, that the case book actually points out that this is one of the very rare occasions where the Supreme Court, in a case that ostensibly does not present a discrimination issue, still notes uh, social unjust, uh, unrest, and race issues. But it also notes it's only one bare footnote. You have to kind of like not blink or you'll miss it. Um, so, I, you know, I think that if you look, there are case books, um, at least in the criminal area, that do sort of cover this, this area. In fact, in, in teaching any kind of criminal course, I think it's impossible not to be talking about race and gender and class. Um, and it's, it's almost pedagogical malpractice not to look into it. Did you just say pedagogical malpractice? Yes. That's the best thing I ever heard. I'm going to start uh, holding professors accountable for pedagogical malpractice. Um, my next question is for Deb. Um, Deb is a contributor to our Integrating Doctrine and Diversity series with essays in volume one and the soon to be published in the next four to six weeks, volume two. Um, in uh, your essay in our first volume, you start your uh, your writing with All Hail the Podcast. Um, and you talk about how students come to your class more aware of substantive criminal law issues because of podcasts and documentaries. And you discuss how you use a variety of media and exercises beyond your casebook to infuse your class with a diversity of voices and perspectives. In your second essay, um, uh, you wrote, students appreciate the opportunity to explore evidence concepts through outside media and podcasts, and some excellent podcasts have given us episodes centered on evidence and diversity. So could you share examples of, of where you do this work, when it has been effective, like, and really like try to inspire us to, to, to use these podcasts or documentaries? Yeah, so, um, and I will also be clear, I've also generated a lot of my own material. One of the things that I do is I script a lot of things for my students, both because it allows me to bring some things into the classroom that otherwise wouldn't be there, and also because it gets the students to be able to participate in a way that's kind of low pressure. Look, I'm just reading out loud from a script, right? I'm not having to necessarily participate in ways that might be more vulnerable. But in terms of the kinds of already existing outside media that I've used, um, one of the things that I used in both my criminal procedure and criminal law class is season two of In the Dark. The podcast is all about the Curtis Flowers case, which many of you are probably familiar with this, was a case that after the podcast aired, ended up being granted cert by the Supreme Court. There was actually a Justice Thomas dissent uh, that said, I, I can't believe we're doing this because of a podcast, which I don't think was particularly fair. Um, but it, one of the great things about that podcast is it really takes you episode by episode through all the things that went wrong in that particular case, focusing on the thread throughout that this is a case happening in Mississippi with a Black defendant, with some white victims, and all of the things that are going wrong, in part because of those racial dynamics, explains things like Batson. And I found some students come into class already having listened to the podcast, but particular episodes of that I found have been really helpful for students in you know hearing about this in the context of a real case and how things might play out. A couple of other things that I've also found really helpful, um, Serial in their third season followed Misdemeanor Court, which is something that I think is not particularly well covered by casebooks at all. We think a lot about in criminal law and even criminal procedure, felony cases, serious cases. And that entire third season is about Misdemeanor Court. And it also has a really great excerpt that I always play in class of a prosecutor making decisions about how to take a particular case to the grand jury and, and describing the facts of that case. And <clears throat> it is a case that's really great for students to follow if they're trying to figure out how all of the discretionary decisions get made in criminal justice. So I found that one to be helpful too. And finally, and this is going to sound kind of counterintuitive, I've been using The Dropout, which is the podcast about the Elizabeth Holmes case, and part of the reason we talk about that case is because you have an affluent 
white, well-educated defendant, which is absolutely not representative, obviously, of who normally gets criminally prosecuted. And I think it's great for students to be able to have a conversation about, well, what happens that's different, right? When you have someone who's well-resourced, who has media outlets, um, who has everything that they could possibly have at their disposal, um, what goes differently with their criminal trial process? And so those are some of the sources that I've found really helpful. And then a couple of documentaries that I often use. I often use Murder on a Sunday Morning, which is a case about a Black teenager in Florida who was wrongfully accused of murdering a tourist and follows his trial and how it is that he ended up being acquitted. And again, focuses in part on the race issues in that case, also on the class issues in that case, and a lot of the other things that can go wrong in your criminal process such that you end up being wrongfully accused and tried for murder. So lots of great material out there. And certainly you can always take a look at my book chapters. I listen, I list a lot of other materials that I use. Thanks. I, uh, I am a huge true crime fan. So like I go to sleep at night listening to very unsettling podcasts. Um, and I, I get really inspired. Um, I, uh, for those of you who are law librarians, um, uh, I watched the ESPN 30 for 30 fantastic lies about the Duke lacrosse case. And uh, the attorney is talking about how he taught himself about DNA evidence. And he like says like, I ordered a book and I learned how to do it. It was this amazing moment where you could see someone talking about how they do legal research in real life um, that I, I thought was fantastic and thought like, this is exactly what I want someone to say for like, before I show the one else what to do, like, this is real, this happens. Um, in uh, whenever I teach um, mass incarceration or when we teach mass incarceration in our race class, we use um, the Netflix documentary 13 which is uh, available for, they've made it available for free um, on YouTube. Um, I also really like the podcast Seeing White. Um, And so I I also find like the use of documentaries and podcasts uh, to be something that the students can, you know, listen to while they're running or uh, commuting. And they seem to get really engaged beyond the ways that I see them engaged sometimes in other uh, types of material. Um, my next question is for Tung. Um, Tung, uh, Tung wrote an essay in our second volume about Krim Pro. Um, in his essay, he writes about using images and videos in his teaching, saying more can be done in the classroom to take advantage of audiovisual technology and the ready availability on the internet of photographs and videos. Tung, can you share some examples of how you have developed this pedagogical technique and give some examples of when you pivot to this in class and why you think it's an effective strategy for integrating DEIB issues into your classroom? Yeah, sure. Um, So I'll start with the last question. Why is it effective? Um, We know that students have different learning styles and some students are visual learners or video audio learners. Um, and for those students, it's more difficult to process simply through reading the cases. Uh, and so there's some advantage to video and, uh, and pictures, um, not simply DEI, but in other areas as well. But focusing on DEI, um, I'll give you three examples. So when I first started teaching Crim Pro 1, which is the investigation course, um, I would want the students to just see how the Fourth Amendment affects us in our everyday lives. So I would ask, okay, who's been pulled over for traffic stop? And almost everybody raised their hand. And I thought naively at the time that, oh, well, you know, this shows a relatively innocuous way in which the Fourth Amendment touches all of us. But of course, it's innocuous for many of us, but not all of us. Um, And the challenge for me, let's say, so I'm an Asian American guy. I don't I won't ever really be able to process what it's like to be pulled over driving while black. I can read an essay on it and I can think intellectually, you know, this is wrong, this is awful, but I can't really viscerally feel it. So I found a video um, online of a traffic stop 
And it's a fairly typical story from the start uh, on the highway. It's a dash cam from the, uh, the state trooper, pulls over a U-Haul truck, and the trooper gets out, walks over to the, uh, the, the truck, the driver, and, and says, uh, you know, can you step out, please, which is already a little bit unusual. And the driver is a young black man. It turns out he's a law student, and this was right at the beginning of the COVID pandemic. Um, and so the schools didn't shut down. He was driving home for remote learning. And, uh, and so I, I show this and the students, I think, are thinking, OK, well, this is just like any traffic stop. And uh, I actually do this in real time. So the very first class, after I go through the beginning of the course materials, introduction, so on, I say, OK, you know, who's been pulled over a traffic stop? And then I start the video. And then uh, after the beginning part where the driver is talking to the officer, I say, OK, well, we'll come back to this. And I go over some more course material. And about half an hour later into the course, I go back to the video um, and I sort of fast forward 30 minutes. So real time and the stop is still going on, which is never I've never had a stop go that long. And at the 30 minute mark, the officer actually has um, the black students. Uh, oh, and by the way, he's on the phone with his dad the whole time. And his dad actually is a judge. And he's narrating what's going on because he wants there to be a witness to what's happening, which again is something that I've never felt the need to have done. And I suspect for many of my students as well. And to just see that this is what's going on, I think is eye-opening. And at the 30 minute mark, the trooper starts to um, arrest the driver. You know, he tells him, okay, put your hands on the, the hood of the, the police car, lean forward, and then he puts his hands behind its back. and. And the driver starts getting quite um, agitated and starts yelling to his dad, daddy, daddy's arresting me. Um, and then he starts wailing, I don't want to die. And the trooper dismissively says, you're not going to die. Uh, which, you know, clearly there's a difference in perception here in power dynamics and the, uh, the driver's put into the backseat of the car. So I say, okay, well, you know, let's go back to uh, course material. And an hour into the course, I come back to the video and now Fido, the drug sniffing dog, is out there checking into the uh, the back of the um, the U-Haul truck. Apparently Fido has picked up on some traces of cocaine or something, which could be three or four drivers ago, who knows what. But uh, our class is run an hour and 25 minutes per session. And the video actually is longer than an hour and 25 minutes. So at the end of the first class, I say, okay, I actually have to fast forward to the end. In the end, the driver, he, he just gets a warning. And so, you know, you might chalk this up and say, well, he didn't even get a ticket, no harm, no foul. But clearly it's a much different experience than I've ever had and that I suspect um, nearly all of my students. And so I think it's a good way to, to demonstrate in a very visceral sense some of the issues that we're going to be talking about in the Fourth Amendment and the way that the race and perception of race kicks in that is much more traumatic than you would get from reading um, on paper. So that's one example. Another one is uh, there's a case that I teach called um, Darden, which is a prosecutorial misconduct case. Um, in the closing argument of a, a aggravated murder case, the prosecutor made some inflammatory remarks along the lines of uh, pointing the defendant, you know, this is a brutal crime. This animal shouldn't be out of the cell without a leash around his neck. Um, and that uh, more comments about animals and so on. And, uh, you know, this might be just the prosecutor going out of control, just really demonizing the opponent. But um, what I, when I get to this court uh, case in class, I have a slide and it's the booking photo of the defendant. And I try to avoid booking photos, but sometimes that's the only photo you can find. And he's a very dark skinned black man. And when you see that and you think about the language of an animal and particularly the leash around the neck, it triggers for me, and now this dates me, but um, there's the old Roots miniseries where LeVar Burton is playing uh, the slave uh, Kinta who, and the promo photos have very prominently, he's got a chain around his neck. And so I just can't help but see that image when I think about that inflammatory argument. And, the opinion doesn't say anything about race. And again, it's not a race issue doctrinally, but I don't see how you could avoid mentioning it. And in fact, the opinion doesn't even tell you Darden's race at all. There's one mention in the entire opinion about race, which is the perpetrator, which you might infer, oh, well, that must be Darden. But, but the fact that the Supreme Court isn't even commenting on this, 
I mean, it'd be one thing if they were to comment and say, but we don't think that this rises to the level of reversible error, but to ignore it completely, um, I think is, is fairly outrageous. Um, and the third example I'll give is um, the cases involving consent to um, a search. Police officer says, do you mind if I look in your bag? And you, the person says, oh, okay, officer, I guess that's okay. And the officer looks in, they find drugs. Is the consent valid or was the person in a position where they felt like they had to? And the, the standard for it is would a reasonable person in this position feel free to walk away or at least end the uh, encounter with the police? Um, so what is the reasonable person? Uh, is the reasonable person, does it encompass race? Does it encompass gender? Does it encompass, encompass class? So what I do is I, um, I show a video from a crime drama, uh, but it's a, it's a Chinese crime drama because in my spare time, I try to work on improving my management. So I watch just all these Chinese shows. And so it, the setup is fairly standard. We've got uh, two police officers, one suspect, but the entire conversation's in Mandarin and there are subtitles, but subtitles are imperfect. And you miss a lot of the tonal cues that we would pick up on in uh, a normal conversation in which we are fluent in the language. And on top of it, um, Mandarin is particularly useful for this because it's a tonal language. So there are four different tones for the same sound and those are all different words. And so not only do you have to be picking up the tones of just the social cue language, but you actually would also have to be picking up the tones about which particular word. So I think it completely flabbergasts students Except for that, there, I did have one student this last semester who I said, does anybody speak Mandarin? One student raised her hand. I said, okay, well, this won't work for you, but for everyone else. If it's so alien to them, then think about what it's like for a non-native English speaker who's in the interrogation scene. And we're trying to process whether we think this person's consent is reasonable based on our assumptions of somebody who's natively fluent in English. And so it sort of highlights that particular problem. I think any foreign language would work, although Spanish, obviously, you would most likely have a number of students who would be uh, conversational or fluent enough in Spanish that it might lose some of the effect. Um, but uh, uh, anyway, that would be that's a third example of how I think you can use videos to sort of really demonstrate the limits and, and maybe weaknesses or problems with the way the doctrine is handled. Thanks. I will be Googling Polish crime dramas <laughs> when we're done. Um, this next question is for, for both of you. What have the reactions from students been to your inclusion of the supplementary material, whether it's assigned or whether it's in the classroom? Um, Deb, why don't you go first? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think it's just because they get a break from listening to me and from having to speak themselves. But I mean, I don't think that I've ever gotten anything other than incredibly positive feedback. I just came before doing this um, from showing my cousin Vinny in my evidence class, which I realize a lot of people know to do that. Um, but I came back to a whole bunch of emails from my students saying, oh, yeah, here's another thought I had about the impeachment that I saw in that movie. And it's students I don't normally hear from. Um, and part of what I really like about showing videos or um, having podcasts or using other kinds of media is that certainly the students do get a perspective they might not otherwise get and engage and understand material in ways that they might not otherwise. But I also hear from different students. And I think it's partly because if you are reading cases in your casebook and you're like, oh, this is the answer I need to get to, and maybe my perspective is wrong on this, I think that you kind of feel like I only have one path. Whereas if you are looking at media, if you're watching true crime, I have had, I don't know how many conversations with students who, once they see I'm true crime friendly and I'm willing to show that in class as an actual pedagogical tool, they'll come into here in my office and have all sorts of questions about the Murdoch trial, for example, that reflect that they're really, you know, trying to apply what they're learning to the material. And again, it's not the students I normally necessarily hear from. And so I think that it's positive both for student understanding and for getting them into a position where they can see things they might not otherwise see. Um, I love the the thought about showing foreign crime dramas. I actually did something fairly recently where I showed a TikTok of somebody who had recorded their encounter with a police officer. And I don't feel bad about doing that because you're posting this to social media. Presumably you'd like to get it out there, whereas sometimes 
some of the materials I feel are maybe a little more exploitative. But yeah, I think it's great for student understanding and also great for just igniting students who otherwise might not feel comfortable participating, might not feel comfortable coming to me and talking to me about things they're interested in. So at least from my perspective, nothing but good vibes. I, uh, I have some questions about the, the what's going on in South Carolina, um, but more from like a sociological, what is going on in South Carolina. Um, I find that the use of like some of the true crime stuff is really humanizing because this is the, this is something that kind of led them to law school. And this is something that's like normal to them. Like media is normal to, to them. And it, especially in the first year, so much of what they read in their case books is foreign and they're trying to figure out their professional identity and how much of their professional identity they need to leave behind. And this brings something human, something recognizable into the classroom. And that sounds to me really affirming. Um, Tung, what have been the feedback from your students? Uh, I, I would say mostly the same as Deb's reaction. Um, I, I've had students who've sent me suggestions for videos and things to show as well. Um, but but I did have one student who, um, that the highway stop video that I mentioned, that was disturbing enough to her that um, she, she decided that criminal practice was not for her. Um, but on the other hand, I, I think that's good to find that out very early on in law school, if that really is the case. So, um, uh, but otherwise, you know, it, in the comments and student evaluations, the ones who do comment seem to like it. Um, there are ones who sent me emails. One student um, uh, on the opposite reaction from the highway stop uh, sent me an email after that first day of class. Uh, will we be getting more videos like this in, in class? So in general, I think it's been uh, very positive feedback. Uh, this is something we talk a lot about in our, our race and the foundations of American law in class because the images, um, specifically interactions with the police, but also images uh, of uh, those who have been incarcerated or enslaved are so graphic and upsetting. It's like really balancing pedagogically, is this going to be so traumatic that we set the students back versus is this going to be able to have them connect with material in a different way? And I think it's hard. And I think that it isn't, there isn't one answer for everybody. Um, but I guess I would agree, like if seeing the realities of the type of law puts you off to that, then maybe it's better you figure that out sooner rather than later. Um, so it, either way, maybe it's instructive. Um, thanks, Tung and Deb. I will, uh, you'll be back after we talk uh, our next, after our next segment. Um, so I'm going to shift my focus a bit from professors who are successfully doing the work of integrating DEIB content into their classes, and I'm going to introduce two professors who may be able to contextualize this further and share a framework to consider for making future changes to your classes. Anamika Twyman Goshal is a senior lecturer of criminology at Brunel University, London. Danielle Karkin La Carraza is an associate professor of criminology at Stonehill College. Thank you both for joining us in the legal ed realm today. Um, we're so happy to have you. Um, one of the practices that I engage with before I start prepping my syllabus for the semester is an audit of my assigned readings and materials. I was looking for some sources about how to audit your materials to share with others when I stumbled upon a blog post by Danielle and Anamika. Um, and Mar Morgan, can you please share the link in the chat? Um, auditing your assigned materials, or in their words, completing a self-assessment of your assigned materials is one of the parts of a framework they developed. Um, can you please talk about the purpose of your framework and take us through the five key areas of action? 
Sure, I'll, I'll get started. Um, so thanks so much for inviting us. It's uh, it, it's great to come in, uh, in in another discipline. So as, as you just mentioned, we're both criminologists, so it's really good to be here. And great to hear about the work of Deb and Tung that they do in their um, uh, uh, lectures and their courses. So that's great to hear. Um, so when Danielle and I began working on this decolonizing framework, I think when we were, we were really um, looking at the aims as being uh, beyond just diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Uh, the idea here is that this diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging is often used really as a panacea for deeper ep epistemic problems in academia, and that's what we were really trying to challenge, uh, which is why this isn't just about anti-racism, but also about decolonization, so it's a, it's a much larger endeavor here. Um, and what we want to do is wanted to do is really to identify that uh, the problems in academia stem from a legacy of colonization that endures to this day. Um, so as we mentioned in the framework, this begins with self-work, which we outlined, uh, um, uh, but also acknowledging the complicity of our disciplines. Um, so for us, that was particularly criminology and looking how power imbalances and injustices remain and are maintained within our disciplines. Um, uh, and, and criminology has a problematic legacy and so does law. Um, and so if our disciplines are complicit in an unequal world, then we as academics have a responsibility to change that. And as Greg mentioned at the very opening, you know, it's about becoming agents of change. And if we really want to uh, teach the next generation to be become agents of change, well, then we need to give them and empower them to do that. Um, and so uh, we try to come up with some suggestions on how exactly to do that. And really, we believe that this is a lot more than just tinkering uh, uh, on the edges, but actually doing something much deeper. And so we talk to start off with uh, two key components. The first one is intellectual reflexivity. And so what that really means is analyzing the historical and social structures uh, that have conditioned the way we think. Each each person has been conditioned to think in a certain way by the institutions, by academia, by our disciplines. Um, and so um, it's really about asking yourself, uh, you know, how has what you've been taught then gets reflected into how and what you teach. Um, so how do you pass this on? And the, the use particularly of uh, and, and replication of, uh, of what you've been taught in many ways in uh, many ways belies the function of law, which is to provide justice. And I think the, the more we get embedded in just regurgitating the same practices, we actually are not making the changes that we as, uh, as academics really would, we, we would like to see. Um, so really thinking about things like how is law presented? What are the sources of law? Uh, what legal traditions are being presented? So, I mean, uh, is our ind indigenous uh, legal traditions being taught? Are they being mentioned? Uh, you know, are these assumptions that ind indigenous legal traditions didn't exist? Are they being challenged? Um, these are all things that require to be part of, of, of a larger curricular uh, uh, thinking. The second part is the anti-racist recall, where you really acknowledge uh, the role of race in society as, and that your identity, your location, your experience, all of that frames reality. And now um, what's really important about that is to move away from these assumptions and this very problematic connection between race and crime. I think we really need to move away from that. Uh, you know, just saying, well, you know, let's talk about race and criminal law. Well, just by making that statement, you are already suggesting that there is a connection between race and crime. Um, and, 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 and these traps are, are out there and we have to be very conscious of that. Um, and so, um, we are all affected by, by that, um, by these racist ideas. Um, that's true for your students. That's true for us as individuals who are teaching them. It's also true for judges and lawyers, and therefore the case books that that that, that we use and the cases that we present to them. So. Um, so just to go very briefly over over this framework as we created it is, you know, as I mentioned, the first thing is about acknowledging your own biases and privileges and talking about, you know, 
that race doesn't just need to be covered in, in, in a criminal law uh, um, course, but it actually needs to be covered across uh, the whole curriculum. Um, we talk about revising co uh, courses and curricula. So that really means um, what uh, she Visvatna talks about in terms of cognitive justice, that we're really talking about diversity of knowledges and uh, equality of knowers. And that's something we've got a, we've, we've got a really long way to get there. Um, so, you know, we need to make sure that we're decentering Western knowledge. And if you think about kind of legal traditions, that very much centers Western legal traditions. So, you know, what are the other legal traditions? So identify them, identify what the emissions are, make sure that students are aware of not just other legal traditions, but also, also alternative forms of justice. Um, we talk about amplifying minoritized voices. Um, now, the the issue here is that we do not want to do that in a tokenistic way, which doesn't mean, you know, sprinkle a few here and there, and there we go, we've diversified. And, you know, this is where we get into this problematic area that, well, you know, we've done we've done our little bit, we've thrown one person of color, and, 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 and so we've done our jobs, but to also ensure that we have a diversity of voices, stories, experiences, um, and being very careful about these ideas of assimilation that we intrinsically tend to uh, tend to replicate. Um, I think there's also a, a, a cautious tale here to be uh, included around what sort of material we include. We've got to be very careful about having this sort of voyeuristic attitude towards black bodies, um, where we look at African Americans as victims. Um, that uh, you know that that we're constantly replicating the victim victimization that happens in society by bringing that into the classroom. Really, it's about empowerment and about shifting that narrative away. Um, Danielle will talk about some of the other elements of our framework. Yeah, and so I think what we started talking about, you know, the incorporation of media is certainly helpful as long as we're challenging and questioning um, what we're seeing, right? Because we know media is, you know, exaggerated and developed in a way to be entertainment. Well, the lives of the individuals who these stories are about are not our entertainment. And so as Anamika just pointed out, we want to make sure that we are um, empowering rather than adding to what media already portrays. But um, some additional ways that we suggest becoming more anti-racist and decolonizing your curriculum is actually developing community partnerships uh, and doing so with local agencies that are supporting the underprivileged, underserved, and underfunded folks with an actual intention of providing them with resources, supports they're currently lacking, rather than, you know, here's a service learning project, go ahead and do it, which then puts the onus on the community partner to try to come up with projects, to try to come up with something to keep your students, you know, engaged in the material and the content that they're dealing with. Uh, so the goal should also be enhancing student learning, but done so in a manner that's reciprocal. We really want to help those partners that are actually making a difference and are on the front line of trying to provide justice and equity to those who are underprivileged, underserved, and underfunded. Again, I think that one of our ultimate goals from our, our papers is to ensure that students are getting an opportunity to learn about the world around them, but not just learning about it, learning how what they're doing can improve and leave behind a better world once they've, you know, gone on into their careers. And then high impact learning. Um, we know we talk about, you know, there's exams, there's papers, there's all of these things that we do in the classroom, but how much of it actually has an impact on the ultimate learning of our, our students? Well, I want to point out that in order for our courses to actually be inclusive, we also have to think about our students in and of themselves, right? Is it actually an inclusive classroom if our students can't access the materials that we have? Um, I recently looked up the cost of casebooks. I, as a, a professor, wouldn't be able to cover the cost of how many casebooks you all need. So starting from there, right, considering inclusivity and accessibility by utilizing open access or open source casebooks or utilizing materials that you put together yourself. Um, but if we're going to talk about casebooks and casebooks specifically as a means of DEIB, then we need to think about what cases are within these casebooks, right? 
Um, I've done a bit of research on my own. I found Common Wardle in 2011, who were talking about the fact that every casebook, and I quote from them, every casebook tends to possess its own angle, identity, or theme, fighting for a share in the marketplace of legal education. Because again, we create our content for courses with a means of making money, right? The folks who are supplying the textbooks, the publishers, there's an ultimate financial goal. So if you are using these casebooks, I'm sure there's good purpose behind it. But as you choose them, make sure you incorporate an assignment or an in-class discussion where you ask the questions. Well, what court, what cases were chosen by these particular authors? What cases could have been chosen instead? Which ones were being left out? Why were they being left out? Um, what information is missing from the casebook? I mean, I just heard uh, you guys were speaking about how race was left off in some of the reviews. Well, why? Question why. Um, I also think it's important that as you incorporate forms of media such as podcasts, documentaries, videos, TikToks, um, and these casebooks, rather than just show them and connect them to the laws at hand, discuss the how and the why these things that we're seeing are happening. Like, how is it 2023 and we're still ignoring race as a reason for uh, these stops to be happening? This, it's 2023. So question the how and the why, um, but also talk about, you know, what is it within those laws that are allowing them to continue to happen and having the students actively engage in thinking about how to shift the laws so that they, the world around us can be more inclusive and more just. Um, so I think, you know, rather than pointing out that there's bits and pieces and factors that are not being talked about, raise the attention to figure out why they're not being talked about and then go a step further. How do we resolve it? How do we make sure the conversations are actually comprehensive and all inclusive opposed to just the bits and pieces here and there that the authors want us to see? So I think ultimately when you ask the question, how can we use casebooks in our courses to make them more inclusive? generate the discussion around the material, around the biases that exist, how those biases are still able to exist, and question them, critique them, because what's going to happen, as Anamika pointed out, is that when our students go on to become attorneys, what they've learned is what they're going to practice. And if they practice without challenging and critiquing, there will be no change. And I wanna go back to our quote that sort of led us here, is that ultimately, our prime goal was to really ensure that the world is a better place after our students leave our classroom. Thanks. Um, so uh, one of the best things about being the moderator of this is one, I get to listen to you all talk about this stuff, but two, I can interject when I'm inspired. And I thought so much uh, about some of the things you said. One, when you were talking about high impact learning, I remember being in college and doing an exercise very similar to the one that Tung described about like, you know, raise your hand if you had like, uh, if you've been stopped by police type of thing. And I remember that to this day, who in my class raised their hand and who in my class did not. Um, to your point about how this needs to be integrated throughout the curriculum, I really personally struggle with this because I believe it should be integrated throughout the curriculum, yet I also work at an institution that has a standalone race class and that that is required. And that is because right now we're not, we can't guarantee it's being done to the extent that it needs to be. So we have this sort of as a remedial measure, but I do really believe, I mean, hence the name of the book, that this should be throughout our curriculum. And it should be as individual professors, we have the responsibility of doing this, but as individual professors who are then on curriculum committee meetings, uh, who are making curricular decisions, we also have the re uh, responsibility that this needs to be throughout the curriculum. Um, I also um, was thinking when you were talking about, you know, the, the some of the flaws, and I was thinking there is not a lot of biographical information about the textbook editors um, and so that's another sort of article in the forthcoming book is from a law student about that. And so really calling on Facebook editors or Facebook publishers to provide information that we know that there is implicit and explicit bias, but to provide biographical information about the people who are editing the casebook, uh, maybe even like a statement about their bias, 
And I was thinking also that uh, at, at Roger Williams, our law review just announced that going forward, they're going to be putting um, headshots of all the authors in our law review uh, in the law review, at, like on the back few pages of the law review, with the idea of we need to know who the authors are, we need to be curious about who these authors are, and we need to be critical about how the, uh, these authors are. So thank you both. Um, I, I thought that that was uh, really, really helpful to contextualize some of this discussion. Um, when I was reviewing the framework, I was really struck by one of your assessment questions, which was whose stories are being told. As we start to prep our materials for next semester, perhaps we can really engage with this question. I think it'd be so helpful if faculty members who teach the same classes at the same institution or at other institutions could sit down with coffee and just work through this question for an hour. I think if we did this, we'd be more open to where we have been ex exclusionary, where we have uh, deprioritized content, where we have made assumptions, where we have prioritized maleness and whiteness, and where we have failed to be critical. Um, and so my question for the two of you is like, what do you think of this? How might you see individual professors or entire law faculties engaging with your framework? How might you see casebook authors and editors engaging with your framework? Yeah, we'll, we'll do the same thing where I'll start and then Tanya will finish. I think we, 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 we quite like doing that. Um, so I think you make a really good point here. I mean, it's about individual professors. It's, is it about entire faculties? And I think, as you mentioned, it, it's actually both. It cannot be one or the other. Uh, every individual carries that responsibility and entire law faculties, entire institutions carry this um, uh, responsibility. And um, when we are talking about uh, a, a, a decolonization, it's it's a, de it's a it's a process. It's a decolonial process uh, rather than decolonizing, meaning that there's an ultimate end point where this is going to be done and dusted and well done. Now we can all pat ourselves on the shoulders. Um, so it is an ongoing effort, and that ongoing effort needs to be a, a, a lot more holistic. And I, I you know, it, it's great to see the engagement in. Uh, with the questions in the framework. I mean, that was the very point of this framework is to allow people to look at that and start thinking about these questions more deeply and looking at their material. Um, and clearly, you know, casebook authors and editors need to consider what cases they're choosing to be included, uh, you know, adding some contextual narratives, but also questioning the assumptions they're making and contextualizing these cases. And, and, and maybe uh, it requires a little bit of a rethink of, of how case books are done. Uh, in the UK, there are no case books. Uh, what there is is case law. And you refer to case law um, as you go through the material, but you don't have a book that is a compendium. Because if you think about the whole idea of a compendium of an edited volume where it tells you which cases you need to look at, well, that suggests already a particular narrative. It already suggests a particular angle that is being presented. And so the question needs to, and as you said, perhaps knowing the biographies of the editors, but even if you know the biographies of the editors, we're really focusing on the sort of identity politics, which can in itself be very problematic. So just because the identity of the editor is is one or the other doesn't necessarily mean that that the pr uh, perspectives that are being presented in the cases that have been selected are going to be as holistic as they need to be. Um, so I think what you know a, a more holistic approach would be to really think about the program as uh, as a whole. You know, incorporating various legal traditions, alternative forms of justice, and really thinking about you know how and what is being taught. Um, where exactly do you teach? Uh, I, I, it, it was lovely to see that at the beginning of the session there was a land acknowledgement, and that is a fantastic start. But sometimes we need to go further. You know, where uh, where are where are these um, sessions being taught? Uh, who are buildings named after? Who are rooms being named after? Who are they not being named after? Um, which communities are the object of each of the cases of the research? You know, is it is it predominantly African Americans who are the victims here? You know, again, I think these things need to be thought out very carefully because we are conveying a very particular narrative as we do that. Um, because we have to also question, you know, who is affected by the laws? How are the laws interpreted in very different ways and if, uh, uh, and felt in very different ways, depending on what community you are? And it's not just about gender. It's not just about race. It's about socioeconomic status. It's uh, uh, it, it, all of that.
that is packed into it. So is that intersectionality of identities. Um, and, you know, and, and what knowledge do we value? What do we think is even important? Uh, what is it that we choose to convey and what do we not convey? All Every single one of those decisions has a meaning uh, and, and whose laws are recognized and whose are not. Um, I think those are all pieces. Danielle? I'm going to echo all of that. I think that everything Anamika just said is spot on and resonates with what I would say, but I do agree, right? The very first step is sitting down either by yourself with your cup of coffee and your material and asking those questions and going through the framework uh, and then bringing it out to your colleagues so that you can learn more from your colleagues as they question why they're doing what they're doing. And it is, it's an ongoing process, right? It shouldn't be a one and done. Okay, cool. My syllabus is great for this year. It'll be great for the next year. It's always ever changing. And we want to ensure that, you know, you don't read the framework, think about it and forget about it. Um, it's as society evolves, as law evolves, we want to make sure that we're revisiting, you know, our biases and the voices that are being unheard. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to bring Tongue and Deb back for my last question. Um, I've heard some criticism from students that assigning material that supplements the casebook sends the message that the material is not as important and we're furthering other we're further othering the already othered in our traditionally white male centered curriculum. Um, if we want to start with Tongue and then go to Deb, how might you respond to this criticism? Um, yeah, so that's a, a great criticism, but uh, my response is that um, I use videos and pictures beyond DEI issues. Um, in fact, the whole reason I started this project was I found a phone booth a long time ago, a real phone booth, and there's a really important Fourth Amendment case involving a phone booth and what it is. And I started to realize, do my students even know what a phone booth is? So I was so excited to be able to show them the phone booth. And then I found... Um, pictures of drugs at the Vancouver Police Museum and uh, having led a sheltered life. I had never seen this stuff. I thought students might be interested just to know what crack cocaine looks like and meth and so on. So um, when I present my slides, uh, I have pictures or videos in almost every class. And I think DEI is an important part of that, but it is not the only part. So um, I don't think the students walk away with a message that, oh, it's going to be another DEI video, but rather it's just, oh, it's another video. It's going to be supplementing the casebook in some other way. And some of it is DEI and some of it is, is uh, you know, here are pictures of the uh, people in the case, although that obviously does have a DEI component. Um, but again, like I said, um, drugs, what do they look like? I have a video on Faraday cages because that matters for another Supreme Court opinion. Um, there's a woman scientist at Science Museum who's a great two minute video demonstrating how to make your own Faraday cage. So I play that so they can see how it actually works. Um, so I think that's how I would respond to that. It, I try not to other it by not singling it out. It's just part of one of many. Thanks, Deb. Yeah, and I think that similarly, I have a lot of supplemental material that has nothing to do with DEI material. I show the video of Larry Hibble, who is a white gentleman, who again, put this up on the internet for all of us to consume of his stop with the police, where um, he's arguing that he shouldn't have had to show them identification or identify himself to them and sort of have my students work through that. What does this encounter look like to you and so forth? And this is something we do pretty much every day. There's that sort of material in class. And so it's not even, I wouldn't describe it as a supplement. It is just part of the class. And I was also a defense attorney in practice. And so we're also constantly talking about the realities of practice as a supplement to what we're doing. So it's all part of a whole, but also I think part of integrating everything is finding that material in the casebook, right? I was really interested when Tom was talking about the Darden case, because I teach actually out of the same criminal procedure textbook. So very familiar with all of this. And often you'll be reading through the cases and you'll find the supplemental material right there in the case that you can bring in to sort of enhance your students' learning. I always give my students a lot of information and we talk 
talk a lot about Dolly Mapp um, and what her life was like and who she was as a person and, you know, why she's an American hero. Uh, and, and so it's part of the case, not just supplemental material. It's kind of finding those Easter eggs in the textbook, too. And so I think that if you do it that way, it's not like here's the real material and now here's the fun stuff over on the side. It's all part of an integrated class. Sure. I think that the pushback on some of that is also similar to one of the questions we got in the chat about open access materials. And the idea is, if we're looking from a DEI perspective, shouldn't law schools also be thinking about the format of and access to instruction materials, thinking about open access texts that include DEI substantive con content? Um, and, you know, as someone who primarily uses open access materials, um, there's this sort of yes, but, which is, you know, and, and that requires a tremendous amount of work to edit your cases um, or to, to select, to organize, to edit, um, to make accessible. Um, that is one of the, the biggest problems that I have is if we're, you know, really going to be accessible to everyone, some of the content that's available OER isn't accessible and making it that way. And so there's sort of a variety of issues to unpack here. Um, I, I do use a lot of OER content. I also realize how much time goes into that and it's resources that some professors may or may not currently have due to their like curricular course load. Um, but I think that's a move forward. I think the more we're integrating DEI content, I think the more that we're considering open access resources, I think the more that we're thinking about it in a framework of decolonization, um, the more we're moving in the right direction. Um, and I just want to sort of amplify um, what Danielle and Anamika said, which is it's not just inserting a piece here and there. Uh, it really is thinking about it holistically to decolonize. And I encourage everyone to take the steps they can right now. And it's going to be uncomfortable and to keep doing the uncomfortable work, but with our eye on this full integration and decolonization. Um, thank you so much to everybody uh, for coming today. Um, I read in my email that at AALS, there is going to be some type of session on the use of Netflix in classes. So I look forward to that. And I hope anyone who's going to that will will attend because uh, I think that's going to go really well with what we talked about today. Thank you to the speakers. Thank you to Morgan and Chelsea and everyone at Roger Williams behind the scenes. Um, we will be back uh, in 2024 with the rest of our Integrating Doctrine and Diversity series. Our book should be coming out shortly. Good luck with the end of the semester and grading, and we will see you all in 2024.